name is Logan, and I will be a worship leader today. Please rise and body your spirit and join me in leading the opening lane. Beloved, the voice of wisdom calls to us from the street corner, the grocery store aisle, the noisy dinner table, and the quiet places of our hearts. Will you listen? Yes. yes. Wisdom calls to us with hard truths, showing us where we stray in our hearts and as a community, and urging us back onto God's path. Will you follow? Yes. God's help, we will follow. Wisdom's call persists through the twists and turns, the rough patches, the barely discernible path forward, and the moments we feel completely lost. Will you hold on to wisdom wherever she takes you? Yes, with God's help, we will hold on to wisdom. Then, beloved, let us worship God together as we cling to wisdom on our own journey along the path of salvation paved with God's love. Yes, let us worship God together. Amen. Please join in singing our opening hymn, Holy God, we praise thy name which is in your red hymnal on page 79.
Good morning. So today, we are going to be talking about being smart and being wise. Do you have someone you know that is very smart? Do you all have people you know that are very smart? I know you are very, very smart. I was going to say, Lila is one of the smartest people I know. Papa and Checkers. You can like be Papa, Papa and Checkers? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but your mama beat you and Checkers. Okay, well, we have some smart people in your family, do we not? And what about wise? What is the wisest person you know? Do you know what kind of wise? Okay, well, we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between smart and wise, and you guys are going to be paying attention, okay? So, according to that, smart is someone who knows a lot of facts. They always think they are saying a lot of data. Did you know? Here we go. So, you're smart. Some, so, so a turtle, a what? A turtle, so a turtle, what food? You know what? What do you remember? So, that is called a red cheek slide because it's called that because it so I have a red cheek slider in my class and it's a turtle and when Emily says it does turtle yoga that's sliding and it has red cheeks. Nice. So it's called the red cheek slider. So if you want to know more about a turtle that's called a red cheek slider, Lyra is your girl, and that is a lot of smart information. Now sometimes we say people are wise, and the difference maybe is maybe they make really good decisions. So we're going to ask, I'm going to ask you, um, I think this might have just said, but I'm going to ask you, to, you're going to choose someone to answer our question. It's kind of like a game show. Like a club, you know. Like a, so, are you smart or are you wise? Okay, so there are some questions. So, anybody willing to answer this out loud can raise their hands. Don't know the question first. Okay, well, I will choose someone to answer this question. Can you go choose someone? You can point to them. Papa. You pointing to your papa? Okay, okay, papa. Um, here's the question. Knowing what makes up a balanced meal, is that smart or wise? Knowing what makes up a balanced meal. That's so smart. Smart. Okay, who's the next person who's going to answer? Raise your hand. Can you choose someone, Lila? Point to someone. Okay, Carla, I see your hand. Okay. Eating a balanced meal every day. Is that smart or is that wise? Um, and one of the one of the people we talk 
about where we go when we want wisdom. We talk about God. We uh, we look at the Bible and Scripture. Um, when you go to somewhere, you will learn more facts about it. And so, right. right. When you go to the aviary, you can learn more about animals. Exactly. Laura, I think you're an expert at being smart and learning about facts, especially related to animals, like at an aviary. You can find places to go to to help you become smart, and shows to watch, and books to read, and you can find people sometimes to go to who help you be wise, like your mama, right? Um, people, especially who are older than us, sometimes they have a lot of experience that we can learn from. And one of the things we're gonna um, we're gonna talk about, we're gonna pray together, and then we're gonna go. But we're talking about how God wants us to be wise, and how we can pray for that wisdom, um, like a man named Solomon did in the, in the Bible. But so we're gonna have one more comment, and then we're gonna end. Okay. So I saw the rabbit in the sky with tables at our house. It was very embarrassing. It was like, it, it, the rabbit's name was... Can you tell me the rest of the story? Okay, let's pray again. That was the end. Oh, that was the end. Okay, we'll tell them another one. All right. Dear God, we thank you for giving us wisdom and helping us be smart. Helping us know things and helping us make good choices. And continue to offer us the abundance of your wisdom Please join me in reading the prayer for illumination. Open to us the power of the stories of faith. Let us hear and know their meaning for our lives. Our scripture reading is in the Old Testament of the Bible. We will read Proverbs chapter 1, verses 20 through 33. You may find it in your Q Bible on page 584. Wisdom cries out in the streets. In the square, she raises her voice. At the busiest corner, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. How long, O oh simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing, and fools hate knowledge? Give heed to my reproof. I will pour out my thoughts to you. I will make my words known to you. Because I have called, and you refused, have stretched out my hand, and no one heeded. And because you have ignored all my counsel, and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when panic strikes you, when panic strikes you like a storm, and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. Then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel, and despised all my reproof. Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their way and be sated with their own devices. For waywardness kills the simple, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But those who listen to me will be secure and will live at ease without dread of disaster. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Please stand in body or spirit and join in singing, Lead Me, Lord, on page 473 in your right hymnal.
Yes, O Holy Spirit. And open our hearts today to your word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, a rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, just the other day, I opened Netflix, some sort of streaming device uh, service, to watch a show, and I started to browse through the things that are targeted to you, right? Some of their suggestions for you, categories. And one of their categories was strong female lead. And then the next one under it was women behind the camera. And I started to know this theme, right? It's a little scary how well they know you. <laughs> if today's scripture passage had a tag or was put into a category on Netflix, it would certainly be strong female lead. In today's passage, we meet a formidable woman known as in the beginning of the book of Proverbs, wisdom is personified as a lady, as a woman. But she is maybe not the woman you would expect. She is not meek or mild. She is not gentle. She is a truth teller. She has become a street preacher. And unfortunately for her, no one is listening. And so by the end of the passage, she proclaims that she will offer a very harsh I told you so message when calamity strikes. And perhaps the way that she phrases things is not how we would phrase them. Maybe the poet who composed this passage overdoes it a bit. It's, it's hard to imagine a God laughing at the calamited, calamities that we bring on ourselves, given all of the other passages we have about a God who is with us in the suffering that we hear in Scripture. But Lady Wisdom knows that the consequences of not heeding her warning are dire. When we forget the ways of God, and when we walk in the way of the foolish or the wicked, as Proverbs likes to say, there are often natural consequences that are disastrous. Those who do not heed her advice or who turn her back, their back on her warning, as the poem says, will eat the fruits of their way. Lady Wisdom offers a stunning rebuke, and she's not afraid to raise her voice in public places or places of power and influence. She speaks as though she has authority. The people are not interested in pursuing a righteous way of everyday living, and the same critique could be held true today. We're easily distracted, living often for ourselves or for instant gratification, rather than thinking through all the consequences of our actions and their impact on other people. In that, Lady Wisdom calls us to a higher purpose. She calls us to do what is right, even if it is hard. She calls us to not just love ourselves, but to love our neighbor. She calls us to grow up, to mature, to leave our childish ways behind us. Now there's a lot of scholarly debates about who Lady Wisdom really is. In fact, later on in the book of Proverbs, in another one of her speeches that is in chapter 8, she reveals that she has been present from the beginning of creation. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago, she proclaims. Ages ago, I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water. When God established the heavens, I was there. When God drew a circle on the face of the deep. When God marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I was beside him, like a master worker. And I was daily God's delight, rejoicing before him always. In fact, she was the first of God's works, as she says, now, some believe that Lady Wisdom represents the ever-searching, ever-calling, and ever-challenging spirit of God, personified here as Lady Wisdom. Just like the spirit does, she shows up in all the places that we do. The busy streets, the public square, the marketplace, the intersections. 
Then there's also the idea of the concept of logos, the word of God, which is traced back here to Lady Wisdom. Sophia, the, the Greek word for wisdom, Lady Sophia, is sometimes understood as the origin of, of Christ, where Paul calls Christ in 1 Corinthians the wisdom of God. And so some people draw that parallel from Lady Wisdom to Christ. Whoever she is, or meant to be, it's clear that wisdom is a way to know God and to know what God asks and hopes of us. The way of wisdom does not mean that we will never have trouble, but it does offer us a way that can lead not just to our own flourishing, but the flourishing of the world according to God. Wisdom is a process that leads us toward maturity. It's a journey that's about a long-term commitment to grow and to relearn our ways and what God wants us to do. It happens in everyday life and in all, even the little decisions that we make each day. One of the things that struck me as I was reading and praying over this text this week is in the public nature of Lady Wisdom. We often think of wisdom as something that's very private and not. As our own personal discernment that we need to do for our personal lives, choosing between two paths, like the Robert Frost poem says, two paths diverged in a yellow wood, right? And, and we're praying over that and it's personal and, and maybe we invite one or two people into that decision and choice. And there is a lot of personal discernment in pursuing wisdom. But late wisdom in this passage is not found anywhere near our private homes. She's crying out in the street, in the public square, in the busiest places that she can find, in the street corner, at the city gates. In other words, Lady Wisdom cries out where people will gather, in public places where she knows there will be a crowd. She will be heard. Lady Wisdom, I think, is here to remind us that there is a public edge to our faith. As personal as it is to us, it is not meant to be. The impact of whether we walk in the way of wisdom or of folly carries beyond our lives. Listening for wisdom, listening for God's voice in our midst and the way to walk is best done in community, in public. In the commentary of preaching God's transforming justice, J.B. Blue writes, Life is lived in community, and we who seek to live wisely bear responsibility to consider the consequences of personal and social choices. This statement takes me back to our roots as Methodists. The founder of the Methodist movement, John Wesley, understood that having a personal, committed, and intimate relationship with God was foundational to the transformation and conversion in our lives. When we experience God's love in a personal way, we are changed. We are transformed. We are, to use some of the language, born anew, born again. This is the beginning of the personal spiritual process called holiness or sanctification to make us more like Christ each and every day. And for Wesley, this was not just about personal holiness. There was also a public and social aspect to this holiness. Wesley wrote, Solitary religion is not to be found there. Holy solitaries is a phrase no more consistent with the gospel than holy adulterers. The gospel of Christ knows of no religion but social, no holiness but social holiness. Faith working by love is the length and breadth and depth and height of Christian perfection. Holiness is social because God is social. God created humankind in God's image to be relational creatures. Social holiness is, you might say, is the practice of obeying Jesus' commands to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself, loving one another as Christ loves us. When Wesley says that holiness is social, he means that the depth of your love for God is revealed by the way you love 
those who God loves every day, which is everyone. This past June, I began a doctor of ministry degree in creative writing and public theology. And as part of that degree, and as part of the very first class, we had to wrestle with what exactly is public theology. It's a discipline um, that is increasing in study and popularity, but it still kind of resists being defined. And in one of my papers for the course, we had to wrestle with some sort of image that, that would define public theology. I used the metaphor that public theology is like, uh, doing public theology is like a bridge, being a bridge. Um, that public theology is meant to connect different publics. To do public theology is to be bilingual and to interpret between different publics, the church at the very least, and the world. Um, there is too many traffic on this bridge as public theology seeks to speak both to the church and to the world and seeks to host a conversation in between them. Public theology also serves as this bridge between our current social reality and the vision of the kingdom of God. It's meant to lead us towards the vision of the kingdom of God, uh, towards action and towards transformation and towards changing the world, connecting us to that vision that is um, the kingdom of God brought real on the earth, a transformed world, the pursuit of the common good. There's lots of different ways you can name it that we seek to build together. Public theology is meant to be a theology that is accessible not just to the academics or to those who have the most smarts, but it's meant to be accessible to all, a way for all to access and realize this, this beautiful vision that God holds out to us, especially the poor and the marginalized. A bridge is one way to describe how we live out that faith in public, the public call, but really, public theology is also a lot like the voice of lady wisdom being raised in the streets. When we forget the basic way of loving justice and doing kindness and walking humbly with God, we and our communities can end up in some bad places. When we exchange only loving ourselves for loving God and loving our neighbor instead of holding all of those together, the world can end up in some disastrous places. When we allow the tenets of our faith to be more like platitudes or nice things to say rather than actively trying to live them out within a community that supports and challenges us and holds us accountable, then we accept less and the fullness of God's dream for our world. All we know that bad things do happen to good people and good things do happen to bad people. And it's not so cut and dry as Lady Wisdom might make it out to be on the street corner. It's also true that we bear a certain and special responsibility for what happens in our world, in our communities, in our families, in our nation. Lady Wisdom's voice is calling to remind us of this sacred responsibility, to invite us into a way of being that is social holiness or righteousness that is lived out by living in right relationship with other people. The beginning of Proverbs, what we heard read today, is her dramatic invitation to pay attention, to listen. Today we're invited by Lady Wisdom to ponder how we might live out our faith in public, how we mature and how we grow in wisdom, how wisdom is meant to go beyond our own lives and our private state how we might offer God's wisdom in the public square, sharing our faith, which is not anything new, but it seems to me that we, especially mainline Protestants, shy away from that public aspect of our faith. For various reasons, we might be afraid of being judged or being rejected in a world that often has a negative connotation and understanding of Christianity. Might confirm our fears just to Quiet. In many circles, I don't know about you, but in many circles I run in, the word evangelism has become a dirty word, as many people have come to associate with a specific theological and political understanding of Christianity that has co-opted and reduced its powerful meaning. The truth is, the word evangelism just literally
literally means to tell the good news. Tell the good news. And the call of Christianity is a call to live out our faith in public life, telling that good news. When we join a church community and we accept membership within it, in the Methodist Church at least, we have membership vows that we strive to live out. And for a very long time in the United Methodist Church, we had four parts to these vows. We promise to support the body of Christ, the church, the people, in four ways. Through our prayers, through our presence, meaning our being present, through our gifts, and through our service. But in 2008, the General Conference of the United Methodist Church, which is the only body that can speak on behalf of the United Methodist Church and change our polity and doctrine and our book of discipline, changed our membership vows by adding a fifth vow. And that vow was witness. witness. The change was actually um, initiated by the Association of Annual Conference lay leaders. Um, so it was laity who initiated this change in our church as a way to underscore the importance of what it means to be a witness to our faith, to our community at large, so beyond the walls of the building of the church. We are to give witness, they said, by not just telling others what we have seen or heard or telling good news, but also, and, and maybe even most importantly, we give witness by the way that we ourselves live. We are to live our faith out in public, on the street corners, on the intersections, in the marketplace, and in the square, just as Lady Wisdom finds herself in the public where people are, calling, inviting, encouraging, warning. We are to expand our understanding of what evangelism means, to pursue God's goodness in the world publicly, which is about pursuing a way of justice and righteousness and right living with other people. Those tenets of our faith, those, those scriptures that we hold dear, to love God, to love our neighbors as ourselves, to do mercy, to love kindness, to walk humbly with God, to walk the path of wisdom that leads to maturity, to prioritize social holiness as well as personal holiness, to travel the way of wisdom that leads to the way of life and that leads to a flourishing for all. To close, I just want to leave us with one of the, since I was started with our Methodist founder, John Wesley, I want to leave us with one way we might pursue that wisdom um, in a way that is attributed to Wesley, a quote that many of you will know, where he says, Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. May it be so. May we pursue wisdom. Thanks be God.
through the streets and throwaways of the world. We pray for those in our lives who are sick, who are in need of healing, or who are awaiting a diagnosis for whatever pain they may have, or fatigue, or anger, or impatience, Lord, we pray that you would be with them, that by your healing spirit you would lift them up and strengthen them, that you would guide the doctors and nurses who care for them and give them wisdom to know the best way to treat those who are hurting. We pray for those on our hearts who are mourning today, Lord. The loss of a husband, of a parent, of a friend, of a sibling. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit might enter in those spaces and offer comfort, offer space for grief from the one who grieves with us, who grieved the death of his friend, and offer a small seed of the resurrection to remind us that your wisdom is foolishness to the life we know, but it is wisdom that believes that death does not have the final say. So be with those who mourn, Lord. Give them space to grieve. Give them hope in the resurrection. We pray for those around the world impacted by natural disasters, storms, fires. Lord, open our hearts by your wisdom to care for them, to provide for their needs. By your Holy Spirit, comfort them and help them in the aftermath, in the rebuilding. Grieve with them, Lord, as they seek to figure out what comes next. We pray for our world, Lord, that you would guide not just your church, but our leaders and our communities and what it looks like to care for the creation that you have gifted us. And what it is like to respect the gift of this world, the gift of our neighbors who are suffering, whether it be suffering violence in places like the Middle East, or Sudan, or the Democratic Republic of Congo, or Ukraine, whether it be those who suffer exploitation and oppression, those who suffer hunger and starvation, or widespread illness, God, give your wisdom to the leaders of this world and to your church that we could care for the least of these and seek the healing of all creation as you seek it, Lord. We pray this and so much more in the name of your Son who taught us to pray with confidence, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now as those who are called by God beloved children, Forgiven and unashamed, let us greet one another with the peace of Christ that, it, that is beyond our understanding. Let us share the peace of Christ with one another. The peace of Christ be with you.
place. So I invite you to um, return to your pews and we'll prepare for our musical offering. And as we prepare for that, we don't pass the plate here, so if you'd like to make a donation and off, an off, or give your tithe or offerings to ministries here at University UMC, there's a basket up front and a basket back. You can do that during this time or when the church is over, whenever feels appropriate to you. And we are reminded that um, God has given us so richly everything that we have in this world. So we're called to give back so that we might support others. And thank you for the gift of our choir.
serve this week or in the coming weeks here at University of UMC. First, today, almost immediately after service, we'll prepare for our loaves and fishes meal for our friends who are looking for a free meal in this community. It'll be downstairs in the fellowship hall. I think that's what we call it. I know so many people here. Um, so uh, if you'd like to join us, we would love your help to help prepare the food, help serve the food, but also to just help sit with our friends and welcome them and, 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 and be a light in their life. So if you'd like to do that, please join us today. Immediately after service, you can head on down. Um, uh, choir is still continuing to rehearse, and don't they sound lovely? Can we just like give a big thumbs up and a hand to them? And if you would like to sound lovely with them, all that is required is a sense of humor, and they rehearse on Thursdays at 7.30. So feel free to come here this Thursday and bring your sense of humor and your voice and join with them to continue to make beautiful music. Um, football resumes this coming Saturday. Uh, our football game is at noon, which means we need volunteers from about 8 a.m. until about 12.30. Uh, we usually work in shifts. It's, it's a great time to spend outside with each other, to cheer on the Turks who are, you know, after that big win against Virginia, going to be on the uh, upswing now. They're on their way to the national championship. Um, <laughs> and then next Sunday, we are going to have a potluck after church uh, next, this weekend, this coming weekend, is Parents Weekend at University of Maryland. So we want to offer a space for any uh, parents who might be in town visiting their students as well as students who might come. We, we want to have a potluck just like we did before. What we're looking for is anyone who'd like to grill again. We want to give a big thank you to Mark and Nate for grilling last time. Um, but if you'd like to volunteer anyway, see me after church. I'd love to uh, 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 make sure we have something to do. We need help setting up in the morning before to help you know, lay out tables and tablecloths and help grilling and other things. But also bring a dish, maybe your favorite dish or something that you love to cook for college students and their families. We'd uh, love to have that next week. After church, we'll have that potluck. And then finally, our rummage sale is, is we're getting ready for rummage sale. There's already things starting to populate the gym. If you'd like to drop things off, coordinate a time where you can do that with either Alice in the office or myself or Pastor Michelle. Um, uh, you might want to put all of us on there in case one of us isn't here that day. Um, and then also we'll need help organizing rummage sale and also help uh, running the rummage sale at the beginning of October. So if, that, if you'd like to help with that, we'd love your assistance. Let us know. And we'll, we'll help you see where the need is. I believe those are all the announcements that we have today. Um, and so I invite us um, to, to stand one more time and sing our closing hymn, uh, Lead Me, Guide Me. It's in this little black hymnal. The faith we sing is number 2214. And we'll continue in the uh, spirit. So the little black book has just the, the chorus part, and then the choir will sing the verses. But we read it and walk for free.
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever.